If your Google alert for the phrase voter ID law, and you do have a Google alert for the phrase voter ID law, right, has only been set for the last couple of years, you would think that state legislatures consistently and constantly make it more difficult to vote. That it is simply something that happens every year like, like clockwork. But if your Google alert is more than two or three years old, you know that what's been going on since the 2010 election is historically unprecedented. Since 2011, at least 180 bills making it more difficult to vote have been introduced in 41 states. That is a new trend. It is not normal in America uh, in recent years. Before the 2006 election, in fact, no state, not even one, required you to have a government-issued photo ID in order to vote. Not one state. That particularly strict regulation is a totally new thing. Then the 2008 election happened with its unprecedented turnout among minorities and the young. And then the 2010 election happened and Republicans took over control from Democrats in 11 state legislatures. And almost immediately thereafter, voter ID bills became really, really popular. 16 states have now passed restrictive voting ID laws or restrictive voting laws. I'm sorry. Every single one had a Republican controlled state legislature, every one except Rhode Island. So then these laws went to the governors and generally speaking, the Democratic governors vetoed them and the Republican governors signed them. So that was phase one state legislatures and then phase two governors. Now we're in phase three, the courts and the and the Justice Department. Last year, for example, South Carolina made it more difficult to vote. Republican Governor Nikki Haley says it was one of her signature accomplishments, things she is proudest of, even though the Justice Department struck it down, saying it might keep thousands of people from voting. The state objected. It sued the government, and now the case goes to court. Earlier this month, the judges hearing the case's scheduled oral arguments for the end of the summer. The state objected, saying that didn't give it enough time to prepare people for the very restrictive new requirements before the November election. Quote, voters not possessing a voter ID would have a reasonable impediment to obtaining such ID in order to vote. The case went forward anyway, and despite that dire warning from the state's own lawyers that there wouldn't be enough time to implement the new law if the case went forward, if the judges rule in its favor, the state is nevertheless going to proceed with its restrictive new voting law anyway. Reasonable impediment, schmeasonable, schmimpediment. Schmimpediment, by the way, is very fun to say. The Justice Department has to sign off on changes to South Carolina's voting laws because of the state's less than stellar history with voting rights. This is true for South Carolina and a number of other states, including Texas, which, hey, also made voting more difficult and then was, hey, also rebuffed by the Justice Department, which is also now in court waiting for a judge's ruling. According to the DOJ, there are a million and a half voters in Texas who don't have the kind of ID the state now requires for voting. A million and a half. So far, that is two states who have seen their voter ID laws rejected by the Justice Department in the last year alone. Now, two doesn't seem like a big number until you realize that before Texas and South Carolina made voting more difficult, the Justice Department hadn't rejected a state voting law in 20 years. Nothing for 20 years, then in just one year, the department has to do it twice. Now, most of these states under the Department of Justice's jurisdiction on these things are in the South. And it's all thanks to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But there's an asterisk there. Ten communities in New Hampshire violated the Voting Rights Act in the late 1960s. And therefore, they too have to get Department of Justice approval. So when New Hampshire's Republican legislature made it more difficult to vote, and the Democratic governor vetoed the law, and then the legislature overrode that veto, changing the legislation only slightly, the state's top lawyer went to the Justice Department for approval. It is now pending. Pennsylvania has one of the most restrictive voter ID laws in the country. That new law, which was again passed by a Republican legislature, is being fought on two fronts. Yesterday, we learned the Justice Department is investigating whether or not the law disenfranchises voters. If the answer is yes, the department would have to sue the state. Pennsylvania is not covered by the Voting Rights Act, or at least by the special provisions leading to heightened scrutiny. Fighting on the second front begins tomorrow. The ACLU is suing the state on behalf of a 93-year-old lifelong voter. She's a great-great-grandmother who, for a variety of all-too-common reasons, simply doesn't have the requisite ID. As part of that case, we learned today, the state admits, and I am quoting them here, there have been no investigations or prosecutions of in-person voter fraud in Pennsylvania, and the parties do not have direct personal knowledge of any such investigations or prosecutions in other states. Think about that. The whole point, 
of voter ID laws is to prevent in-person voter fraud. That is the idea. That is the reason they exist. So when the state says there's no evidence at all, ever, of in-person voter fraud, doesn't that mean the law keeping the 93-year-old great-great-grandmother is maybe about something else? Maybe not about preventing fraud? Maybe? Think Progress interviewed a Republican Wisconsin state legislator yesterday who is a big advocate for his state's restrictive new voter ID law. That law is now before the courts, and Think Progress asked him what the outcome of it would be. What effect would it have on the presidential election? If it were uh, upheld and, and in place in time for the November election, do you think the polls have shown a, a, a pretty raised within margin. Do you think it might yes. ultimately help Romney's campaign uh, here in the state? I, I think we believe that insofar as there are is inappropriate things going on, people vote inappropriately and more likely to vote down. So, so if, if these protections are in place of voter ID, that might not ultimately help him I, I, in a close race? Right. I, I think if people cheat, we believe the people who cheat would be more likely to vote against us. The only catch there, there's no good evidence that people are cheating. But there is good evidence that people who aren't cheating, like that 93-year-old great-great-grandmother, are going to have a much harder time voting for whoever they want to vote for and may not even be able to vote when they show up at the polls in November. Joining us now is Nicole Austin Hillary, counsel for the Brennan Center for Justice and director of their D.C. offices. The Brennan Center is involved in the legal challenge to Florida's efforts to restrict third-party voter registration drives. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ezra. What does it mean in Pennsylvania that they have admitted that they actually don't have any known cases of voter fraud? What does that say about the underlying drive and motivation of the law? Well, Ezra, it actually means there's no there there. Uh, when you go to court, uh, we all know you have to have evidence uh, that supports your claims. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the court is going to want to know what is the evidence that the state has that there is indeed a problem with in-person voter fraud. Th by way of the stipulation, the state is basically saying to the court, we have no such evidence. Uh, so that will greatly benefit the plaintiffs in this case. We certainly don't know what the outcome will be, but this certainly will be a great benefit to the plaintiffs. Now, we've not seen many cases of this type because for 20 years, we haven't had laws like this one that need to be challenged in court. But is there an understood bar which states have to clear in order to clear the Voting Rights Act hurdles? I mean, do we have any sense what the, the court will actually be looking for here? Uh, well, as you mentioned earlier, there are certain states that are covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Those states have a different set of parameters that they have to meet. Pennsylvania is not one of those states, but Pennsylvania is covered under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. In fact, the entire country is. So the Department of Justice um, has the ability to look at those states and to ensure that they are indeed meeting uh, all of the laws and that they are not discriminating in any way against any, any individuals with respect to voting. Mm -hmm. um, so given that, um, Pennsylvania does indeed have to meet those requirements under Section 2, and they do have to ensure that there is no disparate impact uh, that's impacting any of the voters in those states and that all voters are being being treated equally. Now, when it comes to disparate impact, do you, because you at the Brennan Center have studied this extensively, do you think there's a case to be made on the evidence that these kinds of laws would, over time, or in this election or any other, disproportionately affect minority voters or, or other particular groups? Well, the Brennan Center has done a couple reports uh, that I think you're probably familiar with, one that we did in the fall um, that outlined all of the various voter law changes throughout the country. And what our report showed was that uh, the individuals, the groups that were going to be gravely impacted by these changes included members of minority groups, students, the elderly, the poor. So we do think that there is a great deal of documentation out there that will show that there will be a disproportionately negative impact on those groups of individuals. And, and so what, what would you tell voters who are worried about whether or not they have the right ID or, or, or hoping they won't, even, they won't even come to this and they won't need to worry about it on election day. How should actual normal everyday voters be preparing for this world in which there are these very, very stringent new requirements on who gets to actually vote? 
Voters should actually be finding out exactly what the requirements are in their individual states. And as you stated, it varies from state to state. Um, that's part of the confusion. Um, you know, I, I was on a panel recently with the Secretary of State in West Virginia who said that she had voters in her state calling to say, what are the ID requirements in my state? Well, West Virginia is a state that doesn't have those requirements. So that just shows how confusing it is to voters. But what voters need to do is to find out exactly what the requirements are in their particular state and try to do what they can to ensure that they are meeting their requirements. Because what we want uh, is to uh, ensure that all voters have the right to vote, that they can exercise that right, uh, because that's what's most important, regardless of whom they vote for. We want to ensure that every voter has the opportunity to exercise that right. So find out what the requirements are and do what you can to meet them. Nicole Austin Hillary, counsel for the Brennan Center for Justice. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Ezra. Make